Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the seminar Borders and Belonging, Armenians and Azerbaijanis in Saakashvili, in Saakashvili Georgia. Um, we have all heard about uh, the ethnic conflicts that erupted in Georgia around the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, both the Ossetians and the Abkhaz used the window of opportunity, uh, the initial post-Soviet chaos provided to carve out de facto states. And since then, these mostly frozen conflicts have occasionally collapsed into full war, most prominently in 2008 with the Russo-Georgian Russo War. After more than 20 years, uh, no settlement is in sight, no settlement is in sight, and hence a substantial part of Georgia's territory is currently outside the control of the central authorities. But the Abkhaz and the Ossetians are not the only minorities in Georgia. In fact, before the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, there were about four times as many Armenians and three times as many Azeris uh, living in Georgia as there were Abkhaz. So this begs the question, what about the dog that didn't bark? How have the Armenian Azeri groups uh, reacted to becoming part of an independent Georgia? Today's speaker, Christopher Berglun, is a PhD candidate uh, from Uppsala University and a guest researcher here at the research group on Russia, Eurasia, and the Arctic at NUPE. And he will present uh, some of the findings from his soon-to-be-finished uh, PhD. Uh, more particularly, he will discuss the willingness from the side of the central authorities to integrate the Azeri and Armenian minorities in Georgia. And uh, Christophe will speak for some 45 minutes, and then uh, we'll open up for uh, questions and uh, a discussion. But uh, Christopher, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Helge, for this uh, introduction. And thank you for, uh, to Nupi for inviting me here. Um, can you all hear me, hear me all right? OK. Um, indeed, uh, I will today present part, parts of my findings from my uh, doctoral dissertation. Um, and uh, I will speak under the topic borders and belonging in Georgia. Um, I will structure my, my talk around, um, around these uh, bullet points. So to begin with, I will say a few words about the puzzle and the question uh, motivating um, this research, why I think it's a, a worthwhile line of inquiry. Um, I will then move on to the hypothesis and the concepts that uh, structure the investigation before coming to the uh, empirical part, the, the findings uh, of it all. And the findings are structured on, uh, on uh, two levels of analysis. So I will first address um, my findings from the elite level, uh, where I'm interested in learning whether Georgian elites were open to or tolerant to uh, Georgian-speaking minorities, uh, in particular than uh, Georgian-speaking Armenians and Azerbaijanis. And uh, to give a, a short preview of my findings so you know where I'm heading, um, the answer is yes when it comes to the elites. I've, I found that uh, after conducting uh, dozens of, of interviews uh, with government officials and with, uh, with informants in the regions, it seems like the, the government uh, of Mikhail Saakashvili were indeed quite open to integrating uh, minorities. However, um, they encountered opposition in this regard uh, from more illiberal elites that often were, uh, were in opposition. So the findings from the elite level are um, essentially a bit ambiguous. And this is also why I considered it worthwhile to take the investigation one step further, to ask uh, what about the attitudes on, on the grassroots level? Uh, were Georgian adolescents, were the younger generation of Georgians uh, open or tolerant to uh, minorities who learned the state language? And uh, my findings in this regard are uh, quite optimistic, actually. It seems that uh, they are quite, uh, quite open and tolerant to minorities that endeavor to learn the state language. And exactly how I reached this conclusion, you'll 
uh, learn more about in the course of the presentation, of course. Um, but starting then with the, with the puzzle and the question. Why is this worthwhile to study? Um, Helge already gave us some good indications in his uh, introductory re remarks. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's important to stress um, the uh, prevalence of ethnic and exclusionary nationalism um, immediately after the, the uh, breakdown of the Soviet Union. Um, as Georgia was uh, liberating itself uh, from uh, the USSR, um, it was led by uh, a politician by the name of Tsviad Gamsa Khuridia. And he essentially won the first elections on a platform which revolved around the slogan, Georgia for Georgians, and that meant ethnic Georgians. And of course, this left the minorities wondering w what would happen to us in an independent Georgian state. And um, the results were nothing short of disastrous. Um, the minorities in the north, uh, the Ossetians first, and then the Abkhaz, um, thought that uh, if we do not enjoy equal prospects in Georgia, we will uh, go at it alone. We will separate. Um, so they eventually succeeded in separating from the, the Georgian state. Uh, of course, also with uh, support from, from uh, irregulars from the Russian Federation. And uh, the second president of Georgia uh, that succeeded this uh, ethno-nationalist Sviad Gamsa Khuridia, uh, was the famous uh, Edvard Shevardnadze. Um, however, Shevardnadze's policies can essentially be summed up in the politics of omission, uh, as, co as, uh, um, as, as stated by, by Lawrence Broers, one of the scholars of nationalism in the Caucasus. So what I found interesting was that after the Rose Revolution, uh, the government took very vocal efforts to try to move away from this, from this ethnic and exclusionary nationalism of the past to a more uh, inclusionary and civic nationalism. Um, so the prospects of overcoming Georgia's fragmentation, and in fact, the more uh, wider state of fragmentation in the entire region, um, very much hinges on this question, uh, if it can be successful or not. Unfortunately, uh, perhaps most scholars would uh, lead us to be quite pessimistic about the prospects for uh, succeeding in this transition from, from ethnic to uh, civic nationalism. First of all, there is this um, perhaps uh, somewhat uh, ancient notion that uh, ethnic nationalism is somehow more Eastern than Western nationalism, uh, which is associated with being uh, more civic. Uh, so this idea was first uh, uh, presented by uh, Korn in 1944, but it's been around in various forms ever since then. And it was quite prevalent in the, in the early 1990s as well, when you had uh, all these uh, ethnic and territorial conflicts breaking out uh, in, in the Caucasus. But even if we look at scholars that study Georgia in particular, we would perhaps be uh, quite pessimistic. Um, one article that deals with uh, Ethnic, uh, ethnic politics uh, under Edvard Shevardnadze found that there was an undiminished currency for ethnic ideologies uh, in Georgia. And even if we move forward to scholars uh, studying uh, the Saakashvili era, um, the, the conclusions seem often quite pessimistic. Uh, for instance, here we have uh, John, um, Jonathan Wheatley who found that, who made a reference to the lack of a civic model for accommodating minorities. Uh, in, in Saakashvili's Georgia. So I thought it uh, worthwhile to, to look at this question um, yet again, and perhaps also in somewhat greater depth, and ask then, uh, to what extent did the Georgian elites, and perhaps more importantly, to what extent did young Georgians open up to integrated minorities? And what do I mean by opening up? This is perhaps a somewhat ambiguous concept. Um, and uh, its importance can be uh, gleaned if we look back to one of the uh, big scholars of nationalism, uh, Ernest Gellner. Um, he told this wonderful tale about two imaginary regions uh, called, a little bit provocatively perhaps, megalomania and Ruritania. And uh, Ruritania, as the name implies, um, 
is a poor borderland region in the larger empire of megalomania. And the Ruritanians, they tend to migrate to the richer urban centers, precisely because of the economic disparity. But when these groups start to mix, uh, it's often been the case that the, the megalomanians, the rich urban dwellers, they tend to look down upon these uh, rural Ruritanians that, that come into the cities. So then the question is, what can the Ruritanians do to escape the stigmatization? Well, they can either try to shed some of their traits and integrate with the megalomanians, that would be integration, or they can grow frustrated with being stigmatized and discriminated against in the cities, and they can return to their homestead and try to elevate their own culture by demanding a separate state. So that would be disintegration. So when does integration occur? Um, well, Gellner argues, it's essential that we have social and geographic mobility. And the recipe for social and geographic mobility, he argues, and bear with me now, it's that megalomanians must enable megalomanian-speaking Ruritanians to blend in and pursue careers on equal terms. So if we put this in the context of Georgia, it means that Georgians must enable Georgian-speaking minorities to blend in and pursue careers on equal terms. If they do not have the possibility, then they might return and they might opt for disintegration. So this uh, is some of the uh, theoretical, theoretical fodder that uh, underlies and motivates my, my investigation. So let's now continue and, and study um, the extent to which nationalism is civic or if Georgians are tolerant to Georgian-speaking minorities. And here we have some empirical uh, kind of uh, reference points so we can all understand what we're talking about. Uh, this is an ethnic map of Georgia uh, borrowed from the uh, European Center for Minority Issues. And we see here in the middle, of course, the, the Georgian heartland in uh, somewhat orange uh, color. But what immediately pops out as well is the, uh, the borderland regions uh, that are dominated by minorities. So uh, in the north, uh, in the middle there, we have uh, Ossetia uh, or South Ossetia. And in the northwest, we have Abkhazia. Um, but as we already know, they have uh, opted for separation. Uh, so what I'm interested in is to what extent will the minorities in the south um, opt for integration? And the uh, region colored in, in yellow there uh, is uh, Javakheti. It consists of the districts of uh, Akhakalaki and Inotsminda. And next to it in green, we have the Azerbaijani borderland, um, which um, I define uh, as the districts of uh, Marneuli, Bolnisi, and Manisi. So to what extent will the Georgians accept minorities from the southern regions uh, as equals? Starting then with the elite level, what happened after the Euro's revolution? Um, first of all, and quite remarkably actually, um, the incoming government decided to change the national symbols. This does, doesn't happen very, very often really. Uh, so Saakashvili uh, abolished the old flag, uh, the one we see uh, in the top left there. Um, and that had been the flag of the Democratic Republic of Georgia. And to the minorities, it often had a rather uh, negative connotation because this was the flag that had been hoisted by Georgian troops during the ethnic conflict. So in his place, he adopted the, the flag under it. And uh, by the same token, he also changed the state emblem. So instead of the, the emblem in the middle there, he adopted the emblem to the, to the uh, far, far right. And the emblem also contains the national motto, um, strength in unity. So again, we see this very um, symbolic, uh, clear symbolic emphasis on, um, on unity and on integration. And um, yet another way that the government uh, tried to reach out to the minorities was to stress inclusive historical episodes. 
So for instance, one of the uh, common slogans of Saakashvili was uh, forward to David the Builder, forward to David Agmashenebeli. And this is uh, essentially a tribute to, to a medieval Georgian king that managed to reunite the country and against considerable odds. And he then presided over a court that was both multi-ethnic and multi-denominational, but unified around the state language. So this was the kind of historical periods that he's uh, held forward as, as worthy of, of emulating. And uh, he was also not just uh, um, alluding to the importance of integration for the state symbols and for his analogies, but he was quite explicit about this, explicit about it in his public speeches. So, in fact, in his uh, very first speech as president, uh, his inauguration speech in 2004, he, would, uh, uh, he stressed that uh, Georgia is home not only for all Georgians, but also for all ethnic minorities residing in Georgia. And every citizen who considers Georgia as his homeland, be they Russian, Abkhazian, Azerbaijani, Armenian, etc., um, is our greatest wealth and treasure. To indicate also how this was a continuous theme, um, I've also included this the second quote, which, which is uh, from 2014, so a decade later, in fact, after he had uh, left the presidency. And here again, he would uh, actually almost brag here that this is one thing that we changed in Georgia, because people used to be saying uh, very uh, negatively then that, uh, oh, this person is an Armenian or this person is an Ossetian, but if you hate Ossetians, then I'm Ossetian. Uh, if you hate Armenians, then I'm an Armenian. And if you hate Jews, I'm Jewish. I'm everything. But I'm more Georgian than any of you, because what I believe is Georgian is to be open to all the ethnic groups living in my country. So it gives uh, um, some sense of the emphasis that he placed here on, on the importance of uh, inclusiveness. You might, of course, ask whether these symbolic efforts and this rhetoric was anything more than hot air. It's very easy to say things, it's very difficult to do things. Um, but in fact, in many regards, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, speeches and these uh, rhetorical, uh, um, yeah, rhetorical uh, indications, they were backed up by, by concrete international commitments and by domestic institutions. Um, so most importantly, perhaps, uh, Georgia finally acceded to the, um, to the Council of Europe's uh, Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. Um, and around the same time, um, the government started creating a whole series of domestic institutions uh, designed to, to deal with, um, with integration issues. And they created a lot of institutions, as you can see here. So first, um, the president created a state ministry for national accord issues. It was then replaced by a state ministry for civil integration issues, which was yet again replaced by a state ministry for reintegration. Um, so there was also a considerable amount of um, administrative uh, flux and disorganization, but there were many efforts. Um, also, it's noticeable, uh, or we should notice, that uh, the Public Defender's Office created a special uh, tolerance center and under this tolerance center, there was a designated council for national minorities as well as a council for religious minorities. Uh, so the government also tried to create institutions that would enable the minorities to voice their concerns um, to, to the government. Um, he also had a special presidential advisor on uh, civil integration. And this individual was eventually made the head of the Civic Integration and Tolerance Council, which in turn drafted a national concept and action plan for tolerance and civic integration. And I realize this is a lot of different institutions and it's difficult to keep track of, even for me. But uh, the important thing here is that eventually, um, after years of somewhat uh, administrative flux, uh, a structure had emerged that enabled the government to actually deal with these issues, and that had not existed before. And here we see this institution and these institutions and their interrelationships. And um, so the work of the government was organized um, 
and defined by this national concept and action plan for tolerance and civic integration. Um, concretely, however, um, the action plan was implemented by a special commission under the State Ministry for Reintegration. And the commission gathered representatives from a lot of different state ministries and state agencies that all had uh, assigned projects that they implemented uh, with the goal then of, of encouraging uh, the minorities to, to integrate. And all these efforts were monitored on the one hand politically by the president's administration, but also more uh, independently by the public defender's office. So there were a series of, uh, of institutions created uh, to um, realize this lofty rhetoric that uh, I, I mentioned in the beginning. I can't really delve into all the efforts that were made uh, in this regard, but I think it's important to highlight that the government did not protect minorities in their capacity as minorities. The government protected minorities in their capacity as citizens. So instead of recognizing the minorities as equal and separate, they, the government recognized minorities as equal and alike. And this was a source of frustration for, for uh, some of the minority activists. Um, but it is, in fact, a strategy that is quite typical of um, more um, typical civic nation states like France, which also has been reluctant to recognize minorities uh, as a distinct group. It instead recognizes the equal rights of all citizens. So um, Saakashvili introduced uh, tougher bans against discrimination. They were already in place when he came to power, but he, he um, introduced uh, more strongly worded statements in, in, a ver in various laws, like the criminal code, in the law on general education, in the labor code, uh, etc. Um, the ombudsman also opened up uh, local offices in the borderlands so that the minorities would have an opportunity to legal recourse in case that they felt that their rights were being uh, violated. The government also made a special effort to, to reach out to the minorities through the media by funding uh, minority language uh, newspapers, radio and TV programs, and by promoting diversity uh, in Georgian public, uh, uh, Georgian public radio and Georgian public TV. So basically, there was a lot of efforts in this regard uh, to try to signal to the minorities that uh, there was room for them within a common Georgian state and that things had changed compared to the past where the state was advocating very exclusionary politics. Now the minorities uh, were supposed to understand that the um, uh, they were a constituent part of, uh, of the Georgian state. However, these uh, largely tolerant reforms were also undermined in a variety of ways. And this brings us to the second component at the, uh, the elite level. Because apart from the government elites, which tended to be um, Western educated, they were often quite young, and they were often open to minorities, perhaps because they were actually themselves often not typical Georgians. Uh, to take one example, uh, the, the Minister of Internal Affairs was actually Catholic. Um, the State Minister for Reintegration was Jewish. His predecessor was Ossetian. Uh, one of the Education Ministers was an ethnic Russian. Uh, and of course, Saakashvili himself was married to a Dutch citizen. So um, it could well be that the elites had a personal stake in the success of these reforms. Um, if they did not succeed in, um, in uh, conveying this uh, uh, image of an of a inclusive Georgian nation, then perhaps them, they themselves would not be considered to be real Georgians. And this is, in fact, exactly what some of the uh, uh, nativists, as I call them, would, uh, would accuse the government of being. They would sometimes try to ridicule the officials by saying that this is a, a non-national government, or in fact maybe even an anti-national government. And uh, many of these nativists, as I call them, um, they tended to be of an elder generation, 
they had often belonged to uh, the Soviet era intelligentsia. They were more uh, Russophone rather than English speaking. And they often put a great deal of emphasis on the, on the role of the Georgian Orthodox Church uh, in, the, in the making of the Georgian nation. So essentially they were defending not the uh, language-centered and secular nationalism of the government, but a more uh, ethnic and religiously um, um, influenced nationalism. And in fact, the, um, the nativists, they had uh, a considerable amount of uh, wind under their wings. Because during this period, um, the Georgian Orthodox Church and its patriarch were becoming uh, increasingly popular. Uh, in fact, as indicated by one of these statistics, the, the approval rating of the patriarch rose from 39 to 87% in a five-year period. So it, it gives you some sense of just how important the church um, uh, was considered to be uh, at this time. And this also, I would argue, explains why the government elites often compromised their reforms. They were not, of, not always as tolerant as they made them out to be. Um, if we think back, for instance, on the, on the flag, uh, it's impossible to notice that it also has a very clear-cut uh, Christian theme. It's five red crosses. Um, and the same uh, imagery is also present in the national anthem that was adopted in 2004 after the revolution. Uh, it starts with the phrase, my icon is my motherland. Um, again, uh, reflecting this uh, orthodox imagery. Furthermore, the government of Saakashvili did not challenge the constitutional treaty that had been concluded in 2002 between the Georgian church and the state. And this treaty gave the Georgian church uh, a wide range of privileges. It had a special legal status. It was not a state religion, but it had a special uh, legal status that the minorities, um, that the religions of the minorities did not have. Uh, the Georgian church also enjoyed special tax benefits. It had privileged access to the military and to prisons. It received annual transfers from the state budget. And uh, it also enjoyed preferential treatment during property disputes. And this was a particularly contentious issue between uh, the Georgian and the Armenian communities. And uh, I try to illustrate that with this picture on, on, on the right there. Uh, it depicts the uh, Norashen church in the old town of Tbilisi. It's arguably an Armenian church, but uh, during uh, the Soviet Union, all the religious property was nationalized. And after independence, the idea was that it would be, uh, be given back to each denomination. Uh, but in this case, it has not been given back to the Armenian church because uh, the Georgian church claims that it might well have been a Georgian church. So hence, it's uh, an unresolved issue between the two communities. And these are some more illustrations um, through pictures I took during uh, my fieldwork in Kremokartli. Um, on the big picture there, you see that someone has carved something into the mountainside. And I was quite curious what that could be to begin with, but then I realized it's the first lines from the national anthem. Uh, it says, my icon is my motherland, in huge letters uh, on this mountainside overlooking the city of Dmanisi. So whenever the Azeris will drive into the city, this is what they will see. Um, and by the same token, um, when I visited villages in Bolnisi, one uh, another of the Azeri populated districts, I noticed that someone had erected uh, crosses on the hilltops surrounding the Azeri villages. So they would be constantly reminded of the fact that they lived uh, in uh, an outspokenly Christian country, um, so to say. And some other indications of the um, half hearted nature of the government's reforms. Um, Eventually, after some <coughs> seven years in office, Saakashvili allowed uh, minority religions to register as legal persons. Um, so 
he did eventually take this step in order to create a more level playing field between the various religions, but it took a long time and it was a very unpopular move. Um, similarly, um, he adopted a law back in 2005 that forbade proselytizing in schools, but the law was not enforced in practice. So when I visited many uh, Georgian public schools, I often came across um, um, various uh, Christian items in, in the classrooms, which would probably not be in conformity with uh, the spirit of this law. And you see one example of that uh, to the right there. It's an, an orthodox icon. Um, by the same token, he did introduce new textbooks and adopt new curricula with the intention of, of creating uh, textbooks that were more reflective and detached in their portrayal of Georgia's past. And some progress was made in this regard, but it was very slow. And the older generation of textbooks that often were um, very exclusionary vis-a-vis -vis the minorities, uh, and in some cases even portrayed them as uh, fifth columns, uh, these kind of old textbooks, they would still circulate in the schools. Um, so in short, my, my message here is that at the elite level, we see that the government did take some serious uh, efforts. They, um, they had this, uh, these symbolic reforms. They tried to emphasize the importance of uh, integration and inclusion in, their, uh, in the public rhetoric. And they followed up on these reforms uh, through international commitments and uh, the creation of domestic institutions that pursued a variety of, of projects and, uh, and reforms. At the same time, because of the popularity of these um, uh, nativist elites, um, the government made significant, significant concessions. So many of the reforms, I would argue, were, um, were half-hearted uh, half and they didn't uh, implement them uh, uh, properly. And this brings me to the next level of analysis. Um, and this also explains why I think it's very important to ask the questions how the younger Georgians uh, reacted to um, Georgian-speaking minorities. Were the younger generation prepared to accept um, Armenians and Azerbaijanis who learned the state language as their equals? And in order to investigate this question, I eventually implemented a so-called uh, Match Guys experiment for close to 800 uh, Georgian respondents um, gathered in public schools. And I should say a few words first about why I decided to conduct an experiment instead of just doing a survey, because usually when people do these things, they just do surveys. But the problem is that when you ask people direct questions about how they feel uh, about such and such people, they might not answer what they really think. They might answer what they consider appropriate. So you have this problem of social desirability bias. And I reckon that this might be an especially acute problem in Georgia because um, there is this myth of Georgian tolerance, that uh, Georgians have always been tolerant and, uh, and accepting of minorities, and unfortunately the minorities have abused their graciousness by uh, breaking out of the state and rebelling against it. So this was obviously not the case in the, in the um, how to say, um, this, uh, this myth, I would argue, prevents the Georgians uh, oftentimes from looking at the, the period in the early 1990s from a more um, distance perspective because they don't uh, see the concerns that motivated the minorities to separate to begin with. Anyway, how could I investigate these questions without risking that the, minor, that the respondents answer what they consider appropriate instead of what they really think? So the solution was to do this experiment. So what we did, of course, after getting permission from the Ministry of Education and from the school principals, was that we, um, we entered the classrooms, uh, usually grades uh, 10 to 12. So the students were between 16 and 18 years old. And we told them that we are interested in how people form impressions of others by hearing them speak, uh, as we do when we listen to the radio, for instance. And we then played a series of voice recordings for the respondents. But 
what we did not tell them was that they in fact listened to, to take one example, they listened to the same recording of a native Georgian speaker, only presented with different names. So in one case, they would listen to a fluent Georgian speaker, um, and we would present this person as uh, Tamar Maisoradze, a person with a, a clear-cut Georgian name. And later, we would present the same recording, but with an Armenian name. And yet again later, with uh, an Azerbaijani name. And then we would compare the students' reactions, the students' evaluations of the same recording, but when presented with different names, to see if the uh, different name tag uh, elicited different attitudes um, to the recording in question. And by the same token, we can also compare how the students feel about the same persona. If we look uh, vertically in the matrix here, we can, we can compare how they feel about Arpene Sarkisian once when she sp speaks Armenian and once as she appears to speak Georgian. And these uh, are uh, the results, or some of the results to start with. So when the students listen to Arpen Sarkisian, speaking Armenian, this, these are the ratings that she received. When they listen to Arpen Sarkisian speaking in Georgian, that is the ratings to the right there. And I've color coded the ratings so that the higher ratings are in white and the lowest ratings are in gray. And you can immediately see that the Georgians considered Arpen Sarkisian to be considerably more likable. She was more educated, she was more cultured, she was more reliable, she was more patriotic when she spoke Georgian instead of Armenian. And the difference between these means is uh, uh, highly significant as well when we do uh, a two-tailed t-test on them. So it seems clear here that the, the Georgians, they will reward Armenians for speaking Georgian instead of Armenian. And I obtained eventually the same results when it came to the Azerbaijanis. Uh, here we see the Georgian respondent's reaction to uh, Afa Mamedova, a person with an Azerbaijani name, speaking first in Azerbaijani and then in Georgian, representing uh, an integrated Azerbaijani, a Georgian-speaking person with an Azerbaijani name. And yet again, we quite clearly see that um, when they listened to Afa Mamedova speaking Georgian, she was considered to be more educated, more cultured, more reliable, etc. across uh, the entire range of attributes that we asked them about. So yet again, it seems that the, the Georgian students will react more positively when they listen to a person with an Armenian or Azerbaijani name when this person speaks the state language instead of their respective uh, native tongue. But the other side of this question is, is um, do Georgians also discriminate between different Georgian speakers? Uh, we might suspect that Georgians would have a more favorable attitude to other Georgian speakers if this Georgian speaker has a Georgian uh, surname. But after comparing these two, it seems like that is not the case. So here we see how the uh, students reacted to the very same native Georgian speaking recording presented first with um, the name Tamar Maisoradze, the Georgian, and then with the name Arpenis Sarkisian. And in fact, in most cases, it seems like the uh, Georgian speaking Armenian is considered to be more likable. Uh, there are very few indications here um, that the respondents uh, privilege their own uh, ethnics when, when they hear someone speak, uh, speak Georgian. The, the only exception is the last attribute here, the attribute patriotic. There we see that uh, even if an Armenian learns to speak uh, fluent Georgian, she will not be considered as patriotic as a normal Georgian. Um, so that is the one indication of intolerance that uh, I found here. And what do we find with regards to the Azerbaijanis then? So 
yet again, we have the students' reactions to um, the identical Georgian-speaking recording, uh, once presented with a Georgian name tag, and later presented with an Azerbaijani name tag. And some of these differences are not stati statistically significant, but what is clear here is that there is not a single stati uh, statistically significant exception when it seemed w when Georgians um, privileged their own uh, co-ethnics over integrated minorities. So this is, uh, these are findings that I found surprising, um, but that also bode quite well uh, for the uh, integration of Georgia's uh, Armenian and Azerbaijani minorities. So this brings me to the conclusion. If we return to, to the original question, um, did the Georgian elites and Georgian grassroots, did the young generation of Georgians open up? Uh, were they tolerant to integrated minorities? Um, the answer on the elite level is a bit mixed. Um, government representatives did indeed take uh, symbolic and rhetorical measures backed up by institutional and legal initiatives to signal tolerance to the minorities. But these efforts were also uh, undermined by the need to accommodate um, these nativist elites who advocated a more uh, ethnic and religiously centered national project. But the good news here really comes from the grassroots level of the investigation. Um, because judging from the results of these experiments, it seems that uh, Georgians are indeed megalomanians in the sense that they prefer it when people speak Georgian. They will rate them more positively when they do so. Uh, on the other hand, once they do speak Georgian, they do not seem to be to discriminate between different ethnicities. So this indicates to me that um, the nationalism of the younger generation is language-centered, but it is also inclusive. So language seems to be a necessary criterion for inclusion, but also a sufficient criterion for inclusion. Um, and taking that into consideration, I would argue that Georgia's nationalism seems to be more civic or more inclusionary uh, than many previous scholars uh, have uh, held it to be. So that brings my, my talk to, to the end, and I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. We'll now open the floor for, for questions uh, and comments. And might I use my powers here as, uh, as the chair to, to ask the first question myself. Mm. Uh, you said that uh, the Georgians appear to be more willing to uh, integrate the minorities than what you might, you, you might have feared. But, but what is the willingness of the minorities to integrate, to learn the state language mm -hmm. and become fully mm. integrated into Georgian society? And then I think especially in those regions where the minorities live uh, fairly uh, concentrated. Mm. Mm. Uh, are those regions today uh, functioning as well integrated part, parts of the Georgian state? Mm. No, they are not. They are still not integrated, unfortunately. Um, and uh, the reactions among the minorities has also differed between the two regions. Uh, it seems that the Armenians are less willing to um, to accommodate the center's demand and, and learn the state language than the Azerbaijani community in Um So there is a distinct difference between the two regions. And um, on perhaps a side note to this question, um, the, mere, uh, the mere fact that the Georgians uh, seem to be ready for integration hasn't necessarily um, been received among the minorities because many of the policies uh, were implemented without um, very abruptly and very harshly um, and uh, without really communicating the purpose of the reforms to the minorities. So there has been a, uh, a lot of tension in the course of these, uh, in these reforms as well. All this today? <laughs> uh,
thank you very much for a very interesting uh, introduction. I would like also to uh, ask a more general question because uh, knowledge of language is only one of the issues uh, that can facilitate integration. Uh, we know that in the whole post-Soviet space there is this issue of uh, uh, various uh, social models uh, being introduced after the collapse of the Soviet Union and I'm, I would like uh, in the first place to refer to this um, idea of um, uh, open access society versus limited access society. How does those uh, issues, uh, uh, this, this, how does this issue play in uh, Georgia? Because uh, one can think that uh, knowing uh, state language would uh, ease your access to, for instance, uh, career or work or so, something like that, but uh, mm -hmm. there are also some other aspects uh, like like the issue of uh, corruption, uh, the issue of uh, informal networks that uh, play a part uh, how those issues are uh, handled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, Indeed, the reforms uh, in this regard cannot be seen in isolation. Uh, to take just one example, um, before the Rose Revolution, uh, a big problem for the minorities in their interaction with the capital was that um, whenever they tried to drive to Tbilisi, they would often be stopped by the traffic police, and they would have to pay quite significant bribes. Um, but uh, with uh, other institutional reforms that occurred after the revolution, this became less of a problem. Uh, so for instance, with the reform of the police, the minorities could uh, embark on the journey to Tbilisi and they could sell their products on markets in Tbilisi without having to pay bribes to the traffic police along the way. So some of these other institutional reforms, um, I think it did uh, lessen the barriers to interaction between the uh, majority and the minorities. Uh, so it's, it's definitely also a, a pertinent concern. Hello, my name is Henrik Schadva from the MFA. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, when referring to uh, policies uh, on the part of Georgian authorities and, and uh, attitudes among the Georgian elite, mm. uh, you mainly refer to the Saakashvili era, uh, it seemed. Yeah. Have you noticed any, any changes in uh, policies towards national minorities after the change of power? after the Georgian Dream Coalition took over. Mm. Um, thank you. Um, I might not be the right person to answer this question because my research, uh, as you noted, is, is very much focused on the period of, of the now former president because um, this was kind of a critical juncture when a lot of dramatic reforms began. Uh, so I haven't really kept track of that, but what I have gleaned um, from uh, more recent events has not been positive. Uh, for instance, I believe the uh, government has not allocated sufficient funding to language houses in the borderlands. So these were houses in, in the ethno regions where civil servants could go to, to learn the state language. And of course, if you don't finance teachers for them, they have nowhere to go to learn the language. So um, if you don't provide the minorities opportunities to learn the language and you have laws demanding that they know the language, the minorities will perceive that they are discriminated against with good reason. So this would be one example of a, um, something I think the uh, government should take into consideration um, and that they probably have not uh, done enough about. I'm sorry I had to be a bit late, so maybe I missed this part, but I was wondering if you have looking in, looked into the issue of last names. Uh, for example, up until uh, 2000s, when I was watching football, even the black African uh, members of the football team had to have Shvili at the end of their last names. Mm -hmm. And it's been quite a practice in Georgia and some other countries that unless you have the right last name, mm -hmm. you cannot make it into uh, political circles or uh, the right economic circles. Mm -hmm. So this would be the first question. And the second question is uh, when discussing the Armenian minority, have you only focused on Javaheti area, or have you also considered the very well integrated uh, big proportion of the community in Tbilisi? Mm. Because I think there might be two different trends when it comes to the willingness of studying the language and integrating. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
concerning surnames. Um, it has indeed been a problem, and it was very problematic in the early 1990s, when, uh, especially during the period of Tsugad Gamsa Khuria, when uh, this ethnic nationalism was very prevalent, then uh, a lot of minorities seems to have re-registered their names to sound more Georgian, to add the Shvili or the Dze. And it seems to have been particularly common among the Tbilisi Armenians, and uh, to some extent maybe also among the Kurds. Um, I do not have any data indicating how common that is, or has been more recently under the Saakashvili government. Um, but what um, I glean from my own interviews is that uh, it's not an acute problem uh, since, and it has not been since the, um, well, since 1994 or something like that. Um, Armenians in Tbilisi, yes, uh, they are indeed a very different community. Um, and in fact, yeah, they, they differ in, in many respects from the Armenians in Jabakheti. Uh, the Armenians in Jabakheti, um, um, many of them came there uh, fleeing uh, from the uh, massacres in Turkey. Uh, whereas the Armenians in Tbilisi um, have uh, uh, been present in the city for, for a long time. In fact, Tbilisi used to be predominantly an Armenian populated city. Um, and now when it's dominated by Georgians, many of them speak Georgian. So the language issue, issue is not a, um, a big concern for the, for the Armenian community um, in, in, in Tbilisi. Then they tend to complain about other issues like uh, the restitution of religious property uh, which um, has been a source of tension. But I think that the government maybe should try to pay more attention to the status of the Tbilisi Armenians, because that also serves as an indication to the Jabakheti Armenians. Because, because of the fact that the Armenians in Tbilisi speak Georgian, the government's treatment of the Georgian-speaking Armenians serves as an important indication for non-Georgian-speaking Armenians as to whether it pays off to learn the language. Uh, and in this regard, I think it's very unfortunate, for instance, that they have uh, a very poor representation in the uh, uh, in local politics. Uh, that does not uh, serve as a good indication for the Armenians in Jabakheti. Okay. Uh, you, you said that um, there are differences in the level of integration or the willingness to integrate between the Armenians and the Azeris. Could you say something about the role of the neighboring countries here, uh, of Armenia and Azerbaijan? Mm. What role do they play uh, regarding their diaspora in, in Georgia? Mm. Um, I have not done extensive uh, field research in the neighboring countries, um, but there are differences in this regard as well. Um, Georgia and Azerbaijan have perhaps a bit more friendly or trustworthy relations than Georgia and Armenia. There are a lot of infrastructure uh, projects uniting uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey. Um, uh, the uh, Baku uh, Kars Railway and the, the uh, BTC pipelines and the BTE pipelines. So um, because of the, this uh, infrastructural integration, uh, I would say that uh, the Azerbaijani government has been very supportive of whatever the Georgian government has done in Kremokartli, and it has done everything it can to try to keep the situation as calm as possible. Um, the Armenian government has also played a, um, a constructive role in, in Jabakheti. They have also um, uh, assisted the Georgian government in, in many ways, uh, but I think there is a, a deeper level of mistrust uh, between uh, those two sides. Um, of course, given uh, the conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, there has been some suspicions about uh, what the Jabakheti Armenians might do uh, from the Georgian side. Um, on the other hand, uh, the good news is that the, uh, the Georgian and the Armenian states are uh, somehow dependent on each other for transit. The, uh, given the blockade against Armenia uh, from both Azerbaijan and Turkey, they are completely reliant on transit trade through Georgia, and that means that they also go to great lengths to make sure that the Georgians are happy uh, in various respects. Questions? Yes, please. Just a second and you'll get the mic. Uh, so, 
Um, you said that these um, nativist elites uh, sort of uh, hindered Saakashvili's policies to help their integration. Do you think it was uh, political parties or mm. there should be one institution that could be blamed for that, mm. like church? Mm. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, yeah, I, um, I saw those um, icons in the schools and uh, crosses on the hilltops. And I have to say that it's only not in those regions, but everywhere pretty much, so could it be somehow dependent on the influence of church? Mm. <coughs> yes, this is uh, a big and controversial question in Georgia, not least given the um, immense status enjoyed by the Georgian church. Um, it's, I, I agree that the, the nativist elites, as I term them, they are ill-defined, perhaps because they were in opposition, so they did not enjoy uh, offic official positions. Um, I would clearly uh, locate some of the opposition politicians um, in this category. Um, when it comes to internal church politics, I know too little. Um, and maybe to some extent, I think this has been a, a generational thing in Georgia, that oftentimes the, uh, the elder generation have uh, not quite as progressive views on these matters as the younger generation. And I suspect that that's also uh, some f something that is reflected in my findings. I'm not sure I would f get the same results if I were to do this experiment with uh, older cohorts of Georgians. So I think sometimes this is also a um, um, bottom-up process. Um, so I hope that goes some way to answer your question. I, I don't ask a question, but I make a very simple comment on uh, what you said mm -hmm. just uh, five minutes ago. You mentioned about that uh, is, uh, some Armenians living in Georgia coming from Turkey due to massacre. So my, I'm uh, the uh, first counselor of the embassy of Turkey. So uh, this is not, a, a first of all, during that time there was not Turkey. It was Ottoman Empire, 1915. And it was not a massacre, it's a bad sufferings of the Armenian people during that time. And it is not uh, determined by the uh, different uh, authorities, acad academicians or uh, courts, that uh, this is the massacre. So uh, I'm against this term, so that's all. But this is very bad sufferings of the Armenians. We also accept this one, and uh, we are also sharing their uh, uh, sad uh, moments. That's all. My name is Knut Wolbeck, and it's, thank you for your introduction, and it's great to hear about Georgia. You talked a lot about uh, the work, or it seems to me <clears throat> that you're working with the Ministry of Reintegration quite a bit, and, and used that as an example. To what extent have you also worked with the Ministry of Education? Because uh, my experience with working in Georgia and with the Georgians is that the I, I don't doubt your findings, that uh, and uh, but the uh, as far as I can see, there are two problems. One is that there is then a lack of acceptance from an integration point of view of people not speaking Georgian as a mother tongue because according to your test, then people couldn't really detect from the way they spoke, whether they were Armenians, Azeris, or Georgians. They pro the, the, the voice they heard was a perfect Georgian and that you had different names. And I guess many of us, at least I will, uh, accept people very easily when they speak my language fluently. I'm, I'm more uh, critical when they don't. Mm. Uh, and, and of course, uh, visiting Chabaketa, then they're, they're, they don't speak Georgian very well many of them, at least the people I met, mm -hmm. and they have a problem with it. Then the government, so so that is interesting. I mean, uh, did you at all look into the kind of the process of integration? How how far did people have to go in being fluent in Georgian in order to be accepted as proper Georgians and loyal Georgians? Mm -hmm. And the second question would be, uh, how did you assess or did you look into the way the the Ministry of Education worked on 
facilitating language training. Um, one of the last things I saw before I uh, stopped working with Georgia was a new textbook, which was, with all due respect, a very bad textbook. Uh, and uh, the textbook was bad, uh, so it wasn't very useful uh, in teaching Armenian speakers. Uh, this was in Jawaket, uh, Armenian speakers, Georgian. But there were also two problems with it. It was that they didn't have teachers to, to present it and use it. And then it was imposed on the schools in a way that uh, the only time in my life I always, almost was lynched was at a school meeting with parents in a school where this book was presented because they thought it was my book and they were not very happy with it. Uh, so, so uh, um, and I agreed with them. It was not very well done. So, so how do you see the education ministry working on uh, this integration? To what extent is the Ministry of Education also part of the integration process, so to say? And, and how, f how, how fluent will you have to be in order to be uh, accepted by your youngsters? Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you. Very, very good questions. Um, if uh, I start with the, the the point you brought up about how far do you have to go to to be accepted? Um, yeah, I wish I would. I, I wish I had done these experiments with an accent as a cue as well. Um, but uh, that is also associated with some problems. So just to explain a little bit about why I did not choose to do that in Georgia. Um, because that is actually often how the experiment is done, that they use uh, not name tags, but uh, accents as cues to the uh, underlying identity of the speaker. Uh, the tricky part in Georgia is that you have, you have so many minorities that you cannot be sure that the respondents will be able to recognize a distinctly Armenian uh, accent in Georgian from a distinctly Azeri accent or a distinctly Ossetian accent or a Kurdish accent. Um, so that, um, that is one problem, um, uh, a practical problem. Uh, a more uh, principled problem is that when you do the experiment with accents, um, it might be difficult to know, even if the students pick up on the accent, it might be difficult to know whether they rate the recording differently because they pick up on the underlying identity and think differently about it, or it might also be the case that they pick up on the identity, but think that, uh, how to say, um, you, you might think that someone who speaks, uh, um, you might think worse of someone who speaks poor English, uh, not because this person is foreign, but simply because he speaks poor English. Um, so it might also be a bit blurry as a cue. Um, that was one consideration. Uh, but knowing that would be very relevant as well, uh, because obviously the bar in these experiments is set quite high. Um, but uh, for predominantly practical reasons, I, I chose to go about it that way. Uh, secondly, concerning the Ministry of Education, it is profoundly important. Uh, in fact, I think it's indicative that after the revolution, um, Saakashvili did not try to adopt a language law. A language law has been discussed in Georgia for more than a decade by now. Uh, and they still could not agree on the contents of the language law. So instead of going back to that, he basically allowed the Ministry of Education and Science to take a lead on these issues. And I think it's, he also, or I think the, the government gradually came to the realization that um, the elder generation of minorities, they just could not be expected to learn the language. Because learning a language when you're uh, an adult is, is profoundly time consuming and, and difficult. And especially if you're in an environment when you don't regularly uh, interact with, with, uh, with Georgians. So I think gradually he, they kind of gave up that ambition and instead invested even more effort uh, in the education ministry because this was the way to reach the younger generations. Um, but as you're saying, I mean, they, there were profound problems with uh, lack of uh, financial and human resources. Um, they did uh, adopt new curricula and textbooks and also had uh, bilingual textbooks, etc. but the translations were often uh, really, really poor, uh, not to mention the fact that even if they were to implement, uh, or even if some classes in the minority language schools would be taught in Georgian as they wanted them to be, they had no teachers to do so. 
Uh, so it's it's an incredibly difficult problem, and and they need uh, much more resources to be able to do something about it, um, if it is to be effective in uh, somewhat short term at least. Uh, so profoundly important and profoundly problematic. <laughs> yeah. So basically, what you say is that even if you've now gone through uh, the full school uh, curriculum in an Armen in the Armenian region or the Azeri uh, populated region, you are not necessarily fluent in the state language. So you, it could be a new generation now mm -hmm. educated into um, uh, still being uh, not fluent or not able to, to, to move around freely in the Georgian society. Yes. 20 years after the... Um, it 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 still happens yes uh, because uh, even though georgian is taught as a second language uh, in schools whose language of instruction is armenian or azerbaijani the te teaching of georgian is so poor that they cannot effectively uh, acquire the language in that m amount of time um, unfortunately yes my name is ivan alnes i stayed in georgia quite a few years ago for a couple of years, where I tried to implement projects on behalf of EBRD through the banks. And that brings me to the question, because the real problem when we try to achieve things, as Chakasvili has had, uh, for example, is lack of resources. You talked about the resources. Mm. And the, the lack of resources is tremendous in a country like Georgia. and. Uh, wish among the people leading the country is extremely high and then a new leader comes and they change the focus mm. and the resource focus will also have to change is it really possible to expect a more uh, uh, a more forceful change if wished if one wishes so in in georgia as it is multi-ethnic as it is with the neighbors they have got the big neighbors whatever mm. and and all 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 the uh, strong feelings that uh, true Georgians or other Georgians, if uh, whatever an uh, ethnic background they have got, really feels about the country. They are so strong headed. That is my, my perception about Georgians. And I like the country very well, not to put any negative uh, views on, on that, but it's not difficult to run the country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, uh, it uh, it is tremendously challenging to to implement uh, uh, successful policies given the lack of resources, and maybe also just as importantly given the lack of focus. Because too often, when there is a change of minister or even more so a change of government, things fall apart quite quickly. Um, so, um, but uh, in the longer term perspective, uh, I'm not quite quite as pessimistic, I suppose. But yeah. Maybe we should end at that uh, rather optimistic or moderately uh, optimistic <laughs> note. Um, thank you very much, uh, Christopher, for the presentation. We wish you the best of luck with uh, wrapping up your dissertation over the next few months. And I would like you all to uh, join me in giving uh, him a big hand. Thank you.